This week, author Rajani Laraka talks about developing the recipes that are part of the plot for Midsummer's Mayhem, her children's novel that she calls an Indian-American mashup of Midsummer Night's Dream and Cupcake Wars. That meant a lot of failed experiments where it was like, oh, that's, that's not tasty. <laughs> I think that's a good metaphor for writing and for life. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and on the other end of the line is my mother, Caroline Kilborn. Hello, everyone. Beautiful day here. I hope it is where you are. So we're in Iowa. Some of you may realize that. And uh, RAGBRAI, the Register's Annual Great Bike Ride Across Iowa, is happening this week. And my sister-in-law, mom's daughter-in-law, uh, rides on rag rice. So she and 20 some of her friends were at my house last night because Fairfield <laughs> was one of the stops. <laughs> they were very well behaved. Well, they had a nice place, had a nice big basement to sleep in. And, yeah, and yeah. yeah. They were very grateful to be indoors, not having to pack up tents. And it rained during the night, so they were especially happy not oh. to, have to pack up a wet tent. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. Okay, good. So that was a lot of fun. So this week, we are talking to a children's author, Rajani Laraka. She was born in India, raised in Kentucky, and now lives in the Boston area with her wonderful family and very, very cute dog. She earned a (laughs) BA and an MD from Harvard and spends her time writing novels and picture books, practicing medicine, and baking lots of sweet treats. I'll bet. (laughs) Midsummer's Mayhem is her first novel. And you can find Rajani Laraka online at rajanilaraka.com and on Twitter and Instagram as well. So you can look for her there. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Rajani. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And am I saying your name right? Yes, it's uh, it's close. It's Ru- close. it's Rajani. Rajani. Yes. Oh, and you yes. told me that, and I still got it wrong. Okay, Rajani. Oh. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> now that I'm guessing is an Indian name. It is. It is. But Laraka sounds like perhaps not. That's an Italian name. That's my husband's <laughs> last name. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good combination. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll say. And is that the same combination in your novel, or is are are both the parents Indian in the novel? In no, novel? the in the in the novel, um, the mom is Indian like me, mm-hmm. and the dad is not Indian. The dad is not Italian either in the uh, novel, but okay. <laughs> we'll forgive him that. <laughs> We we will yes, but he, but he loves food like Italians. <laughs> he does. He definitely yes, does. Everyone yes. in the novel loves food. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm guessing that that food and cooking and baking must be one of your first loves. Yes, I mean I've always loved food. I didn't come to baking until uh, later in my life. When I was um, a kid, I mainly just if I baked, it was from a mix because you know my my mom really didn't know that much about baking. But then, actually, when I was in medical school, I had a roommate who was quite a baker, and um, she, you know, I was all intimidated, and she said, ah, you just need to have the stuff around. So <laughs> we became roommates, uh-huh. and we got all, we had all the stuff, and then we, uh, you know, baked up a store in medical school, and then, you know, after that, I kind of caught the baking bug, and so I've baked a lot through the years, and um uh, got to experiment more and more, and I had a lot of fun coming up kind of with the food ideas for this book. The main character in the book, Mimi, is, how old is Mimi? She, she's she's 11. 11. She's 11, and she mm-hmm. loves to bake. And, you know, I learned to bake from my mother, but I have mm-hmm. I have a little baking story because um, my m- mom, you m- mostly baked from scratch when we were kids. Mm-hmm. You know, certainly mm-hmm. cookies, right, Mom? Right. And and um, most things that you made, pies and everything, were from scratch. And oh, yeah. after I left home, I had I was baking, and I was trying to bake brownies. And I loved the way the brownie, my mom's brownies, tasted. I had never baked them at home, obviously, or the story wouldn't mm-hmm. make any sense. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and 
I had tried these different recipes and none of them all came out quite what I expected. And so I called mom and I said, would you please give me your brownie recipe? And she said, open the box. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's just great. <laughs> so, so it turns out that I think it was Betty Crocker's brownie mix um, beat, yeah, all probably. The beat all the probably. recipes that I had found up to that point. <laughs> it, it is, I mean, that mix is pretty foolproof, I will say. Yeah, and in is. a pinch, like, why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, do you remember it now? <laughs> no, now no. I do, but I yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so, so, Reginie, tell us a little bit about what types of writing you did before this, before Midsummer's Mayhem. Yeah. So, um, I so I was one of those kids that was really obsessed with books. Um, since you know, as far back as I can remember, I read pretty early, and I always had a book in my hand, like on the school bus, you know, during reading time at school, um, at the dinner table, you know, pretty much at the breakfast table, kind of all the time. And my parents really, um, you know, they allowed me to do that, and they allowed me to read pretty much anything I wanted. So I read a lot of um, novels, of course, but I also read nonfiction, and I read comic books, and I read cereal boxes, and kind of whatever I could get my hands on, and. Um, I did a lot of creative writing in school, you know, elementary school, middle school, and high school, but um, I, I also knew that I wanted to be a doctor. So um, I remember in high school, I had a creative writing teacher, and um, I I said to him, you know, I really love this, but I don't think this is what I'm going to do for my career. I, I really want to go into medicine. And he said to me, and I'll never forget it, he said, you know, you don't have to choose. He said there are lots of writers that uh, that lots of doctors who are also writers. And um, he told me about Richard Seltzer and William Carlos Williams and Oliver Wendell Holmes and gave me some books to read. And so that kind of was, you know, planted as a seed in the back of my head. And then I went to college. I did some more um, creative writing. I did, you know, I wrote some plays. I wrote some personal essays. And then, you know, I went to medical school and residency, and that was kind of the end of creative writing for a while because I just had to stuff my brain too full of other things. Um, and uh, then I had children. <laughs> and I, I mean, lots of people write with children, it seems like, in their, you know, with small children in their house, but I couldn't imagine how I would do that. So it wasn't until a few years ago when my kids were in school and my medical practice was established that I kind of you know, went back to, well, what am I going to do creatively that's just for me? Because up until then, you know, my biggest... Um, form of creativity was, you know, making meals, baking things, and planning uh, birthday parties for my kids. So um, I actually, I took some classes online. I decided to do some writing, and I took some classes online, and it quickly became apparent that I wanted to write for kids. And um, and then uh, I met some wonderful uh, writers in person at classes, and then we formed critique groups, and then that that started it. Once you have people who are expecting you to show up once a month with something, you know, something written or something revised, then you kind of keep going at it. Um, yeah, and then a few years ago, I decided to uh, actively pursue publication, and. Um, by that time, I had written this novel and um, five picture book books that I thought were in the right shape to that you know wow. they had a chance of being published. Yeah. And are they are all the picture books being published also, or have they been? Um, there, I have um, five picture books that are slated to be published between 2020 and 2022. Oh, so wow. yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been an exciting time. <laughs> wow. So can you tell us a little bit about them? Yes. Well, I can tell you. So publishing is funny because even though you have, um, you know, you've got deals made that you're going to be published, you, sometimes you can't announce them until lots of other things fall into place, like the illustrator is chosen and all that stuff. So I can tell you about the three picture books that, um, that have been announced publicly. Okay. Um, so the first one is coming out in 2020, and uh, it's with Lee and Lowe Books, and it's called Seven Golden Rings. And it's a picture book that reads like um, – a folk tale from ancient India, but it uh, it also introduces the concept of binary numbers to young readers. So it's kind of it's kind of fun. There's like a little um, math puzzle in the center of this picture book. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's a it's fun. I I enjoyed it, and and you know you can read it without needing to know anything about math or anything, and you don't have to kind of read the author's note that explains um, the binary numbers. But it is kind of fun. Um, and then I've got two coming in 2022. One is called I'll Go and Come Back, and it is going to be published with Candlewick. And um, it is a story about a girl and her grandmother, and it's about an uh, Indian girl who travels to India to you know, visit her relatives and is lonely and homesick. And um, her grandmother helps her through uh, playing with her and through food, which is a theme in all of my books, as you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> And then the grandmother comes to visit the girl in the U.S., and she's lonely and homesick, and the girl helps her. Um, so that, yeah, I'm excited about that one. And, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm excited about all of them, but that one is really close to my heart, and it um, it is inspired by my relationship with my grandmother. Um, and then there's another one in 2022 coming from Abrams, and it's called Where Three Oceans Meet, and it is the story of a girl who takes um, – she takes a journey in India to the very tip of the subcontinent um, to the place where they say three oceans meet. And um, it's the uh, Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, and the Arabian Sea all meet there. And they say that you can see three different colors of water. And I've been there, and I think I did see three different colors of water. So I don't know whether that's an optical illusion or not, but it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, and it's about kind of immigration and um, – missing your family and the strength uh, and love that mothers pass on to their daughters. Wow. That sounds really, <laughs> really interesting. And, Thank and you. the picture books, they're geared towards up to age eight, something like that? Yes. Yes, although I've um, I've heard of teachers using um, picture books um, for older kids as well because they're so kind of bite-sized and easy to um, right. discuss in a classroom setting. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, so we say they're for younger readers, but of course they're also for their parents, right, who have to read them to them. So, right. <laughs> so I think they're for and everyone. Over and over. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, in my opinion, I think they're for everyone. <laughs> it is funny how kids love to hear the same stories over and over again. I know. I that is one of I think honestly that's one of my favorite phrases from when my kids were little is the, you know, do it again. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I <laughs> loved it. I just, yeah, so you know you have a winner when they ask for it 20 times in a row. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. <laughs> so it's interesting to me that all four of your books, it sounds like, are coming out from different publishers. Is that yes. unusual? I don't know. <laughs> Because I'm so I'm so new to this that um, you know I think uh, uh, I I really believe that just like not every book is right for every reader because you know people have preferences and what kinds of books they like um, you have to find the publisher that is right for your book so um, and I think because I didn't start with one book and then kind of wait and then. Um, only submit uh, books to a, a particular publisher. We kind of had a lot of things ready at the very beginning, so we kind of, you know, got to shop uh, the books around to different publishers. And so I ended up with, um, I really feel like so far, you know, in terms of the process, I feel like it's it, they've been the perfect publishers for each project. So mm -hmm. I'm really happy. Oh, cool. Yeah. With picture books, how involved are you in the production, you know, the illustrating and so forth? Do you have any say in it or not much? So um, I will tell you what I know so far. So I've okay. been very fortunate <laughs> in that um, all the publishers that I've worked with for my picture books have solicited my opinions on illustrators before the illustrators were chosen, and um, which I think is pretty unusual. So I feel really fortunate, and the people who uh, the artists, you know, who will be illustrating these three picture books that I just mentioned, are in incredibly talented, and I'm so excited to work with them. In terms of um, the actual kind of commenting on the illustrations, um, I'm you know only part way into the process of the first picture book, so I don't know everything yet. But so far, I've seen character sketches and gotten to make comments on that. And of course, the editor of the book and the art director of the book also make comments. So um, I think that, uh, and then I'm, I think I'm going to be seeing more art um, in the 
in, in about a month or so. So I'm really excited because I'll see scene sketches then, I think. So, um, yeah, I've been really fortunate, I think, in that um, I get a lot of uh, – I get to – a lot of have input, input into yeah. the illustrations, yeah, yeah. Did so, you have uh, ideas of of what you thought, you know, as you were writing, did you have pictures in your mind of what the illustrations for a particular part might consist of? You know, honestly, not really. <laughs> because the, I tried not, I tried not to, I, I mean, well, for me, the story kind of spun out in like a little movie in my head, but I wasn't married to what it, you know what I uh, envisioned, and I think it's good that I'm not that visual because it's that means that whatever the illustrator comes up with is going to be so much better than anything I could have imagined. So I think it's good. <laughs> You're listening to Writers' Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Rajini Laraka, and she's the author of Midsummer's Mayhem. So, Mom, do you want to – let's talk a little bit about uh, Midsummer's Mayhem and um, Shakespeare, which I know you have some knowledge well, some, teaching Shakespeare. Yeah, some yeah. knowledge of it. But, you know, I was, I was just thinking, you know, I started out my teaching career as an aide in the, in the, the, um, the class. With, it was uh, for slow readers, in high school for slow readers. And um, we had, uh, we had a, a lot of books that were um, high interest, low vocabulary. And I was just thinking some of these picture books might be really tremendous in, is, in a, as a tool in that, you know, because uh, yeah. we have pictures besides the words. It, it, it adds so much to it. And, um, Absolutely. So, and if, and if yeah. anybody's not confident in their reading, they, it's, it provides a, kind of a, a pathway into reading because the pictures yeah. draw your interest that can help you understand. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if they still have that program or not because I haven't been there for quite a few years. But, uh, but uh, it was a good experience for me to start, and um, I met some uh, some interesting kids. and And I'm I, I'm proud to say that we raised they they raised uh, their grade level reading skills almost four four grades by the time they were through with the, wow. with the years. Wow! Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that was that was really good, really good for them. Okay, so this this <laughs> this story, uh, of course, um, Midsummer is supposed to be a time of craziness, kind of in Shakespeare's um, uh, thing, and this is a, this is a crazy thing. <laughs> but you know, what, There's what, a lot, what I a lot what, of crazy things going on for sure. Yeah, but <laughs> what I really liked was that, that that this young lady, when she baked, she used she used the plants and flowers and things. In yes. the baking, I thought that was amazing. Do you know a lot about about baking? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think over the years, just through practice, uh, yeah. You know, normally when I um, bake, I you know I follow a recipe exactly, but. Um, I got to experiment um, for the recipes of this book, and I had so much fun. That meant a lot of failed experiments where it was like, oh, that's, that's not tasty, but, <laughs> or that didn't really rise very much. <laughs> but I think, that's a, I think that's a good metaphor for writing and for life. <laughs> so, so Midsummer's Mayhem is, um, let's see, how can I describe it? How, how how do you describe it in a few words? What do you like? Like in one I, paragraph. I just I describe it as um, an Indian American mashup of a Midsummer Night's Dream and Cupcake Wars. <laughs> perfect. That's perfect. Very good. Very good. Yes. So, what gave you the idea of incorporating this sort of modern take on Shakespeare's Midsummer's Night's Dream? into a book for middle grade readers. Yes. So um, let me tell you a little bit about how this story came to be. So when I was a kid, um, I, you know, my dad didn't travel very often, but when he did, he was sometimes gone for up to a week. And I, being a child with an overactive imagination, wondered when he came home, how would I know if the person who came home wasn't actually my dad, but was some like other person that looked exactly like him? 
<laughs> so I made I made up a series of like quiz questions basically to kind of you know make sure that you know only my dad would know the answers to these questions and you know luckily it was always him but um, <laughs> when, <laughs> when it came time to write a novel I thought to myself that that memory came back to me and I was like well what if there was a family in which the dad came home from a trip and there was something wrong with him and you know this girl was the only one who noticed and so it kind of grew from there and so I was like okay well under work, what circumstances would you know the girl be the only one who noticed and I said oh I know it's a big family they got a lot going on there's you know she's the youngest one and she's you know she's kind of doing her thing and all her um, siblings kind of steal all the spotlight um, and then um, another idea I had was you know what if somebody had an imaginary friend who ended up not being imaginary but who was actually real but was somehow supernatural and so then I thought about it and I was you know I've always I live in Concord, Massachusetts, um, which has beautiful conservation areas, you know, woods and beautiful trees and things like that. And I was like, well, oh, you know, magical people in the woods, that's got to be fairies. And then I remembered my love of Shakespeare and this play in, in particular, Midsummer Night's Dream. And I, and there is actually a line from the play that relates directly to the family in my in my book. And once I remember that line, that was it. It all fell into place. I was like, now I know what happens. So in, in, it, this is kind of like a continuation of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Like, what if that had actually happened? What would happen next kind of thing? Oh, boy. Well, it was it was a page turner. I got to admit, it was. Because you oh, really thank went, you. You just wanted to know what was going to come next. I mean, there were so many things going on. You just, you know, it was it was good. I enjoyed it. I oh. really did. And it was, thank it was you. a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was. So, Thank you. So um, Mimi, who's the, the main character, the 11-year-old, um, mm-hmm. she's trying, she's entering this baking contest, and she's trying, and so it's just, even before, even before that happens, there's a lot of references to food, and a lot of, I really enjoyed kind of the descriptions of things in terms of taste, even, mm-hmm. even I think sometimes things that weren't edible. Yeah, you know, they weren't food, but you were you were describing them in the book in terms of taste. Is that something yeah. that you that you do? Do you think in terms of flavor? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think I, I. I like to do kind of exercises in my mind where I think think in terms of flavor. And when I wrote this book. I really tried to channel um, the idea of food, of, of taste and smell and all the senses that are associated with food because that was the perspective of my main character, that she was, she was obsessed. I mean, she is obsessed with food, right? She just loves it oh, so yeah, much. Yeah. And so she, she thinks basically she thinks about everything in terms of food. And so all of her descriptions and all the metaphors she uses are all um, food-related. Yeah, yeah, and she when she bakes things, everybody you know that's kind of her talent. But it seems to be a lesser talent to her than her siblings' talents at the beginning. Yes, yes, I think that this is um, you know I I I think this is true of most people that the things that we're good at we we tend to discount, and the things that everyone else is good at we tend to you know mm-hmm. raise up to great heights. And so, um, yeah, and I also think that, um, you know, I've seen this with my own children. I think that younger children sometimes look at siblings who are much older than them and think, well, I can't do that. And, you know, when the real truth is they can't do that now, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they're never going to be able to do that. So, yeah, um, she she discounts what she's able to do because she just thinks, ah, you know, that's just like my – my siblings and my parents think I'm good. Like, have I ever really have I ever really proven that to anybody else? Where she feels like all her siblings have um, been become kind of famous in their town for their various talents. So, talk a little bit about how you incorporated aspects of Midsummer Night's Dream into the story. Yes. So, first, I would say that you know. My overall goal was to channel the kind of 
spirit of fun and whimsy and kind of madcap adventure that is in that play and um, have that spirit kind of infuse my novel. Um, the second thing I would say is that um, the setting is really important. So in Shakespeare's play, um, the, the kind of two settings are the city of Athens, which is kind of the regular world in which, um, you know, uh, King Theseus and Queen Hippolyta are about to get married and, um, you know, uh, Hermia is kind of uh, against her dad's choice for the man she's supposed to marry. And then the other part of the setting is the magical woods, some distance mm-hmm. from Athens. We're not sure where they are. And that's where all the fairies, you know, live and they, uh, you know, engage in kind of uh, crazy antics um, that really mess up the lives of regular people. So um, similarly, in Midsummer's Mayhem, um, they're kind of two settings, and one is the little, the charming New England town of Comedy, which is a um, thinly veiled uh, uh, depiction of my own hometown of Concord, Massachusetts, you know, home of famous people, literary um, <laughs> people, <laughs> uh, and um, and then the magical woods behind Mimi's house, um, where she meets very interesting people and finds herbs and flowers to bake with. So um, I tried to parallel that as well. And then, you know, the other thing that we don't often think about with The Midsummer Night's Dream, but it's true, is that, you know, it's a it's a play that deals with a lot of conflict. It deals with um, conflict between the king and the queen of the fairies. It deals with conflict between two friends who used to be like sisters, but now are fighting over a, a man, um, and between a daughter and her father. And similarly, there's um, a decent amount of conflict in Midsummer's Mayhem, um, and some of which is caused by Mimi, <laughs> inadvertently. Um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of people arguing with each other and striving against each other and um, I tried to you know make that part of the play as, as well but ultimately you know the the, the book is about um, kind of finding your place in your own family and mm-hmm. kind of recognizing what's most important to you right well it's it's kind of funny I'm right now just coincidentally start listening to a book on tape on audible Circe which oh is, my goodness! <laughs> which is about someone else who uses herbs and and to to uh, have effects, and it's about Greek gods and goddesses and and so forth. And so when I'm listening to that, I'm thinking about this too and the similarities. Oh wow! Well, yeah. I'm completely flattered. <laughs> <laughs> have you, Have you read that? Have you read that book? Uh, not, yet, not yet, but it is right at the top of my pile. I'm yeah. so excited to it, read it. It's, yeah, it's amazing. It is so good. It is so good. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's funny that even after all these years, um, you know, centuries, we still have interest. These these mythological stories still draw us in. And in fact, um, we had an author we interviewed a couple weeks ago, Julia Berry, who wrote. Uh, lovely War, which was a World War One love story centered mm-hmm. into, a st- um, framed by the story of, um, uh, let's see, the goddess of love, and why is her name? Aphrodite. Aphrodite, and mm-hmm. and her affair with Ares and getting caught by her husband, and, and so there's that story framing it, so this seems oh, to be... Oh, my goodness. Yeah, this seems yeah to be, it was uh, interesting. It was. I oh, I, I know, yeah, I know that author, and I have to read her book. I've read every single one of her books, uh, but that, that one I still yeah, have to read, yes. Yeah, it may not be out yet. I think it's just coming out now, so... Oh, but, I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. Now, Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare's play, mm-hmm. is a play within a play. And yes. And you have some aspect of that here, too. Yes, yes. Um, Mimi's older brother, Henry, um, is a part of a community theater pr- a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream in the book. And I, I knew from the very beginning that I was going to do that because I um, I figured that most of the young readers and possibly a lot of the you know adult readers of this book wouldn't be familiar with the play. So I wanted a way to um, introduce the play and kind of the most important features of the play that are paralleled in this book um, in an easy way and in uh, an, an entertaining way. Yeah, I wonder so that's fun. And- if you're not familiar with, with Shakespeare's play, if are there things do you think a reader would miss 
or do you think you were able to you know it's hard for me to say because I am familiar with it so I, when I see the parallels or and I you know I recognized Puck very you know before the secrets out and right um, and but so I wonder if it's be it's more fun to read if you do have that familiarity well, based on what readers have told me, um, they, people have said that even people who don't know anything about the play have enjoyed the book because enough of the play is kind of uh, explained and referenced in the book that it's fun. But, oh, people who are familiar with the play, there are all kinds of Easter eggs and all kinds of funny quotes <laughs> and stuff coming out of, you know, left field that you're like, oh, wow, okay, that's so funny. So, you know, it's I think it's like super fun if you know the play but right. it doesn't I mean but it's also fun if you don't know the play and I'm I'm hoping um, and I think this is true for some some young readers who didn't know the play before they read the book and then enjoyed the book and are like maybe maybe I should read the play or maybe even better I should see the play performed which oh, I think yeah. is like you know the best introduction to Shakespeare for young people and for well, any people actually particularly <laughs> if it's a professional um, performance because yes I the first time that I saw real professional performance of Shakespeare, it was um, it was the uh, British the Royal Shakespeare Company on tour, and so they yeah. were he they were here in the states, and the difference in in that versus you know your community th you know theater production, not to take anything away from community theater and they can do wonderful productions. But the difference when it's a, an actual uh, Shakespeare, trained Shakespeare actor, you get, you understand so much more of the words, which can be kind of hard. You know, the mm -hmm. text can be kind of hard to grasp when it's going by really fast in the play, but they, they carry, it carries so much context when it's really, really well done that I feel yeah. like you, that you can grasp a lot more of it. Yeah, yeah, we've seen some pretty amazing productions of A Midsummer Night's Dream. It is, uh, it's so much fun to watch performed. And, um, one of them was out at, uh, Shakespeare and Company, which is in, in Western Massachusetts. Mm. And it was done outside on a summer night and next to the woods. So they were, I mean, the fairies were literally swinging onto stage from the woods and oh. you believed it. You believed that they were actually fairies. It was amazing. It oh, really wow. was amazing. Wow. Is this your favorite Shakespeare play? It is my favorite. I have a I have a really close runner up though. <laughs> and which one's that? It's uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Ah, I love yeah, that play yeah, right. so much. Oh my goodness! Yes, yes. So that's um, that's really close. And then my third favorite would be The Tempest. Mm. Yeah. How about yeah, you, so Mom? Two with... <laughs> do you have Do you have a favorite? Me. Yeah, you. <laughs> no, I don't really. They, I'll tell you, there were so many, and, you know, trying to teach them to high school kids, um, it kind of, it wasn't as much fun because, you know, they, they, they were fighting me every way, every way uh. they could. But uh, but it was, you know, it was, it was I don't know. That, that was back in the day. Yeah. I have to let it go. <laughs> You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is... Rajani Laraka, author of Midsummer's Mayhem, and I interrupted you. You were going to say of your three favorites, two of them were. Oh, two of them have a supernatural aspect to them, and one of them does not. Okay, it's funny. Yeah. In in Shakespeare's um, comedies, mm -hmm. um, there's always seems to be. You know, I I used to go to the summer fest Shakespeare Festival in Iowa City every summer, and and. It's like there's always a prince or a duke. There's always um, mistaken identities. There's mm -hmm. often gender bending. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always a fool or a jester who's who's really the wise one. And, right. Um, and there's often a storm. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Shipwrecks, storms, yes. Yes. Um, twins. Yeah. Twins, yes, that's the other one. A lot of twins, yeah. which lead to the mistaken identities. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I think my favorite Shakespeare play is Othello, which is oh, obviously yes. much more serious. And um, but that's because that's the one that I saw first saw performed professionally, and so it mm. really really stuck with me. But I have been yeah. to um, I've seen Macbeth performed at the Globe Theater in London. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. That was pretty yeah. Cool. My husband and I spent two weeks in England for our honeymoon, and we saw four Shakespeare plays. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, we saw two in London and two in, in Stratford-upon-Avon. It was really it was really wonderful. Yeah, so we've got oh. kind of Shakespeare on the brain in our house for the most part. <laughs> so how – so were you so familiar with the play that as you were writing – I mean, did you still have to look things up a lot? Did you like sit down and read it again before you started writing? Tell me, tell me how you, how you uh, researched it. Yeah, so I I did um, read it again before I started writing, and then I constantly referenced. I, I constantly went back to it to try and find the quotes that I needed, and um, uh, for you know for reference purposes, and it was just. Every time I looked at it, it was really fun. And then um, when uh, I worked with my editor, he actually suggested some extra enhancement with Shakespearean language of one of the scenes. And I, like, he was, it was brilliant. I was like, wow, I can't believe after all the time I worked on this, like, you came up with this brilliant idea that's even better. So it was, it was really fun. Yeah. We had, we had a ball. And the language is so much fun. It's, it's just a ton of fun. Well, Rajini, why don't you read us a little bit from Midsummer's Mayhem? Sure. So I'll read you the opening, and then I will read a little bit from the second chapter when, sh- when Mimi meets some interesting people. Great. This, so here's the opening. Chapter 1, The New Neighbors. The song from the woods first called to me on a bright June morning while I sat on the back porch swing rereading my favorite cookbook. I could only hear a few notes, a small taste of a half-remembered melody that meandered through the air, but I was instantly hungry to hear the whole thing and discover where it came from. I crossed the yard and stopped at the edge of the woods. As the music drifted toward me like an irresistible aroma, I held my breath and stepped into the trees. Hey, Mimi! My big sister Jules's voice yanked me back to reality. I spun around. She was dribbling a soccer ball, of course. She leapt over the ball and ran to me. I need your help. I push my hair out of my eyes. That's the kind of hair I have, the kind that's always in my face. (laughs) Did you hear it? (laughs) Did you hear that? I asked. Sure, I could still hear lingering notes in the summer air. I want to... Jules grabbed my arm and pulled me toward the porch. She pointed at the driveway next door where a moving van and a silver car were parked. The new neighbors are here. Let's bring them those brownies you baked this morning. But those are for Dad. Welcome home, Brownies, since he'd been gone all week. Make him something else. Come on, don't let them see us yet. But a tall teenage boy with shaggy brown hair was carrying boxes into what used to be my best friend Emma's house. So that was why Jules wanted to go next door. He's cute, huh? Jules said. I shrugged. He looked around Jules's age, 15 or 16. I want to make a good first impression. Bring the Brownies, and whatever you do, don't tell Rhea. Our sister, Rhea, is a year older than Jules and five years older than me. She's like an Aleppo pepper, striking and fragrant, but with a substantial kick. We reached the back (laughs) porch, (laughs) and Jules pulled her dark hair out of its ponytail. I'll be down in a minute. She sprinted inside and bounded up the stairs. I turned to the woods and listened again. Nothing. I missed the song already. Where had it come from? It had been a single, fluid line of melody, repetitive, insistent. It might have been a bird, but it had an elusive quality that made me wonder. And why did it sound so familiar? I couldn't care less about the new neighbors. I wanted to turn right back around and head into the woods like I used to do with Emma. She loved quests. If only she still lived next door. But Jules was going to take my brownies over there whether I liked it or not, so I figured I should at least make sure they were presented attractively. I grabbed my cookbook off the porch swing and went into the kitchen. As I cut the brownies and put them on my favorite purple platter, I couldn't help smiling at the scent of chocolate and cinnamon. These were supposed to be for Dad, who loved chocolate. Who didn't, but would particularly appreciate the warm spices I'd put into them. I even added a dash of cayenne for extra zing. 
How now, spirit? Whither wander you? My brother Henry made a beeline for the brownies. I blocked his arm before he could grab one, and he recoiled dramatically. He was constantly reciting lines from the latest play he was performing in, and barely spoke normal English anymore. None for you, Shakespeare, I said. Not unless you come next door with us. We're taking them to the new neighbors. Henry bowed deeply. Fear not, my lord, your servant shall do so. He took a pitcher <laughs> of lemonade from the fridge and poured a glass. What's going on? said Rhea. I hadn't heard her come into the room, but then being light on her feet was one of the things that made Rhea such a great dancer. She looked up from her pump phone just long enough to scrutinize me with hawk-like eyes. Oh, nothing, I said nonchalantly. Jules would kill me if Rhea found out our plan and tried to tag along with us. Every boy Jules likes seemed to be a, become obsessed with Rhea instead. We're saying hi to the new neighbors, said Henry. I'm going for Mamie's fantastic brownies. How remarkably boring, said Rhea with a smile. She turned back to her phone. Oh, that was a close call. I let out a relieved breath and finished arranging the brownies. Bits of the song from the woods played in my mind. It tugged at me like a secret waiting around the corner. Jules barreled back into the room. Ready, Mimi? Her hair was in a ponytail as always, but it was neater than usual, and her lips glistened. She stopped short. What's everyone doing in here? Rhea sized up Jules. We've been waiting for you. We all want to meet our new friends next door, don't we? Jules glared at me and mouthed, thanks. I was about to explain that it wasn't my fault, but Jules had already grabbed the platter and stormed out the door. See what I mean by page turner? See what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and what's really so cool is you've introduced all four siblings in like four pages, and we get, yeah. we've gotten a really clear image of each of them. So that's, that's, pretty, right. that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. And um, now you're going to read from Chapter 2? Yes. So um, I'll just fill you in a little bit on what happened. So that platter of brownies was not long for the world. Like they ate a few of them, and then Mimi accidentally kicks a soccer ball into them, and the whole platter shatters. So she has nothing to give her dad. Um, and uh, so she decides to bike into town, into their little town, to a new cafe called the While Away Cafe and see what they have and see if she can buy something for her dad. So I will um, read a little excerpt from that. So um, she goes into the While Away Cafe, and this is what she finds. The cafe was beautiful inside, decorated in pale greens with clusters of wooden tables, mismatched chairs, and vases bursting with fresh wildflowers. Soft, dreamy music played overhead, and the faint scent, faint scent of tree pollen and grass wafted through the air. It felt like being in the woods. The place was empty. There wasn't even anyone behind the counter. A bright pink poster near the door caught my eye. Attention bakers ages 8 through 13. Enter the While Away Cafe Midsummer Baking Contest. First round, bring in your best baked goods to earn a golden leaf. Second round, the golden leaf winners will bring in more baked good to, goods to be judged and will be narrowed down to three. Third round, a live bake-off on Midsummer's Eve. Your delectable delights could win you enchanting prizes. A wave of warmth trickled through me like melted butter. A baking contest in comedy. A heartfelt welcome to the while away, came a nearby voice. Startled, I turned to find a curly hair waitress right next to me. How may I help you have the sweetest day, she asked. My excitement about the contest had made me forget what I was doing. I spotted the display case at the opposite end of the room. Can I look at your pastries, I asked. The waitress curtsied, flopping her brown curls forward, and indicated the way. She wore a wild skirt made of fresh green leaves and bright pink flowers. A variety of tempting treats filled the pastry case. There were pies, cookies, brownies, tarts, and my favorite, cupcakes. Each cake was beautifully decorated with perfectly piped frosting, swirls and rosettes, leaves, and miniature flowers. I decided to get two different cupcakes and give Dad a choice when he got home. I'd like one of the chocolate cupcakes, please, and that purple one with all the flowers. Oh, yes, and will you have a drink, my dear? Her accent was slightly odd, but I liked it. Just the cupcakes, thanks. She put them on a plate and led me to the back of the store. Come sit you down, then, at this table here. I hadn't played on stay planned on staying, but I felt bad leaving the waitress to a completely empty cafe, so I followed her. I could sample each cupcake, decide which was best, and buy another for Dad. I sat at a table where I could see out the back windows to a small footbridge that went over to the river to the, to the woods. It was only a couple of miles through there to my house. 
The waitress made no move to leave and sort of hovered near my elbow. I sniffed the chocolate cupcake. It smelled rich, and it looked inviting, with the dark swirl of frosting on top, right up Dad's alley. I peeled back the paper wrapping and took a bite while the waitress watched my face. To my surprise, the cake itself tasted like cocoa-flavored cardboard, and the frosting was too sweet with an oily texture. I put the cupcake back on the plate and forced myself to smile. Your face is quite a sight, the waitress said, twisting her hands. It's awful, am I right? I looked at her. She seemed barely older than Rhea, with big blue eyes and a small pink flower pinned to her hair. I'm sorry, I said. It's a tad dry, but let me try the other one. I quickly unpeeled the the pretty purple cupcake and took a bite, which I regretted immediately. This cake was too moist, soggy and falling apart like someone had soaked it in juice. The frosting, lovely as it looked, tasted like a sugary version of the paper mache paste that Jules had once tricked me into tasting when I was six, (laughs) telling me it was mashed potatoes. This time I couldn't hide how disgusting it was and had to spit it out. Is this supposed to be a grape cupcake? That's right. Oh, dear, she'll be so angry now. The waitress gave me a sheepish look. It's not for lack of trying, but know-how. You baked these? Yes, and no one likes them, don't you see? My, the owner was so very cross with me. It seemed unfair to put this girl in charge and then be angry with her, since it was obvious she knew nothing about baking. Isn't there anyone who can help you? She flared her nostrils. The one who knows the most won't lift a hand. We struggle every day, you understand? Wait a second. Was she rhyming? We try, and though we all must play the part, she leaned toward me and whispered, We have no clue of how to even start. Uh, Why don't you get a good book on baking? I can recommend a few I love, I said. Perhaps. She leaned toward me again. You seem to know an awful lot. Could you perchance assist us with our plot? But I'm not. Oh, that would be so lovely. You're a dear. I'll go speak with the owner. Just wait here. She started toward the counter. But (laughs) she looked back at me pathetically. Please tell me that you'll help us. Twould be awesome. I sighed. What's your name? Peas Blossom. She dipped a small curtsy. What kind of parents settled their kid with that name? <laughs> and, of course, if you know the play, you know, I think, you know, I think, when was it? Sometime when I was, it was grade school, junior high, long, long time ago, we did mm-hmm. a version of Midsummer Night's Dream, and I think I might have played Pease Bottom, or else... Is there one, is there one like, named Moth or something? Yes, yes. Okay. There's Moth, there's Cobweb, there's yeah. Mustard Seed, and Peas Blossom. Yeah. Well, I was one of them. Oh, wonderful. You were a fairy. I love I was it. A fairy. Yep, yep. And I was about as awkward as she is. <laughs> Poor Peas Blossom. She's yeah, in over her head. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> So I notice on your website that um, there's a little thing here. Want to plan a Midsummer's Mayhem baking event? Mm-hmm. So, and you can download any Midsummer's Mayhem baking event kit. So what is that? Yes. So um, I worked with um, Curious City, which does kind of really fun things with authors and books. Um, and uh, Kirsten Cappy is the name of the person there. And we um, cooked up like an activity guide um, for anybody who wants to do a baking-themed Midsummer Ma- Midsummer's Mayhem event. So it's full of um, little riddles that can be used as um, what – uh, the clues for what people should use in their baked items and um, uh, all the recipes from the book. So I, I think I have nine recipes of things that I came up with while I was um, writing this book. And I made them up and I tried them out in my own kitchen and they they work. <laughs> so um, fun things, everything from the um, cinnamon cayenne brownies that I mentioned um, in the first chapter um, to some uh, to uh, rose cardamom cupcakes that come later in the book mm. and uh, chocolate chunk cookies with uh, thyme and citrus, which also comes later in the book, and uh, lots of others as well. Um, and uh, and then there are little um, certificates for kind of um, pr- quote unquote prizes. So there are lots and lots of certificates that lots and lots of kids or adults could earn um, for participating in the uh, baking contest. 
How fun. We had just a ton of fun. Yeah. <laughs> have, do you know if any any groups have done this yet? I don't know yet, but I do know in September, um, September 15th, I'm going to be at a local um, bookstore uh, near me in Belmont, Massachusetts, and we're going to be having a kids' baking contest Aww. that day, and I'm hoping that some of this, yeah, will, will be used for that. So that should be a lot of fun. Now, I also, yeah. also noticed on your website that you have, um, like, presentations for schools, and I know that schools loved having author visits. And have you done any of those yet? Probably not because this got published after school was out and school hasn't started yeah, back I, yet. But. I actually did um, I did a school presentation in um, May in uh, at a local school in Massachusetts um, before the book was out, but it was really fun. It was uh, for uh, – it was a writing kind of workshop for seventh graders, and we um, – I kind of told them about my path to publication, and then we did some writing exercises um, on using all five senses in writing, um, with an example being um, the first paragraph of Midsummer's Mayhem, kind of before revision and after revision, kind of adding all the sensory detail that I could. And that was really fun. And then I just came back from a trip to the West Coast. I was at uh, Nerd Camp Southern California, and um, they had a Camp Nerdling the day before Nerd Camp. So Nerd Camp is a, a kind of a, an education camp model, but um, it includes teachers and authors. So um, the day before that, we they had a Camp Nerdling that was all um, children. So they had students come in, and uh, we had groups of kids coming around, and uh, uh, we did presentations for them. So I did um, some presentations for them as well, and it was so much fun. Oh, I bet. And it looks like you have three different versions of the writing workshops that you offer for kids. Yes. Yes. So one of them is kind of um, – uh, for larger assemblies, um, and it's more kind of talking about how I got to be uh, where I am now, and um, the others are more kind of hands-on, uh, nitty-gritty, um, let's, you know, let's spend a few minutes writing together kind of things. I like the one called Magical Revision. You want to tell us a little bit about what that is? Yeah. Um, you know, I take uh, kids through – so to me – you know, I, I remember being a kid and wishing that, like, once you wrote something once, you could just, like, that's it. It would be perfect. <laughs> and <laughs> as we all know, that that's just not the way it works. <laughs> so for me, revision is where all the magic happens. So um, I talk about kind of the things that I look for when I revise. And uh, oftentimes I will go sweep through a certain section of the book and I'll look for, um, you know, characterization and um, plot and making sure the plot makes sense and um, theme and you know that's actually one of my favorite parts of revision is thinking about what the overall theme of the book is and how to you know insert it into uh, subtly into places um, before the ending so that when you get to the ending um, it's satisfying so yeah I talk about those kinds of things yeah it's really it's fun oh golly <laughs> <laughs> Mom, did you ever have any authors come visit class when you were teaching English? No, unfortunately, I didn't have that opportunity. I wish um, I wish I yeah, had. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. I never I had it either when I was a student. Kids. Yeah, I don't think I did either. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think this is just such an exciting idea, and I will tell you, as an author, there's nothing as exciting as connecting with you know kid readers. They're oh, fun. Yeah. Mm, yeah, bet. one of the Absolutely. one of the events I just did in California was was at a bookstore, and they had um, they had a middle grade book club, you know, full of kids, and half of them had already read the book. So I got amazing questions. It was so it was just so incredible to to um, you know hear from kids who had actually read it and and enjoyed it. It was it was completely overwhelming and lovely. So. Rajini, tell us a little bit about your writing process. Um, are you, do you set aside a certain amount of time every day? Um, do you have a certain place where you write? Do you write on computer or on pa paper first? And, and do you write fast and then go back and edit, or do you edit as you go? Oh, these are such que great questions. So, <laughs> so you know, as um, a mother and as a working mom, you probably know that, like, there, 
my routine was really kind of wrapped around my work schedule and my children's schedule for a long time. And so as a result, it made me a very um, flexible writer in terms of where I could write and when I wrote. So basically, I wrote whenever I had time. Like I would write, you know, if I um, in the you know hour between when uh, – you know, when I got home and when the kids showed up, I would write then. I would write after dinner. I would write, um, you know, sometimes on my phone in the line, in the car line waiting to pick them up. I would go to a piano lesson with my laptop and just, just <laughs> write a few things down. Um, yeah, so I, pretty much I've, I've written almost everywhere. Um, wow. And, um uh, yeah. And, you know, now my children are older. So, like, you know, now after dinner, they have to go up and do homework. So, you know, I've got a lot of time to myself. And uh, um, and my husband is often working, too. So uh, I have more time, you know, to myself now. But, um, yeah, so it, it, I was flexible. I do like writing. I do like typing because my handwriting is atrocious. I think that's from years of being years of being a doctor. And, uh, it goes with the territory. Yeah. I know it's terrible. There are times when I will have written something and I'm like, I can't read this. This is really disturbing. Like I wrote it. How is it that I can't read it? (laughs) But um, yeah, so I like to type things. uh, I like to type things up. And in terms of so I do I, I my writing process is iterative. So I do um, write a draft and then I I before I go on to the next piece, like I will go back and look at that. you know, uh, chapter and kind of revise or edit it a little bit. But there are times when I think um, when things are going well and going easily and then you don't want to stop yourself. So I just kind of keep going forward. Um, but, yeah, I am one of those people that uh, I do go back and revise a little bit even as I work forward on a first draft. And for me, first the first draft is the hardest. I I find it very difficult to – just get it all down, even when I know what needs to happen sometimes. Um, but once I have it down, um, I love revision. So mm. <laughs> that's why it's magical. It's magical ah. to me. It's very good. <laughs> how, many, how many drafts do you do? Oh, my goodness. I don't even know if I can count. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that, for my first book, I guess what I would say is for my first book was the book that actually taught me how to um, – you know, how to write a novel. So, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if that's fair. So I wrote many, many, many versions of this book. Um, but you know, I think, um, I don't know. And I believe that every book is different. So, um, we will, we will see, but I mean, I would say there were at least three major versions of this book. Um, and then maybe a four, yeah, and a fourth before um, it actually got acquired as a book. So yeah, so there were, there were a lot, um, and then there were so many micro revisions, and you know during that right, time, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're almost out of time, but one last question: Are you writing another novel? I am. I am working on a companion novel to Midsummer's Mayhem, um, and I'm hoping I'm hoping it will be published one day. But uh, the idea is that it's set in the same town with different characters. Um, wow. So yeah, and, so and we is still... there a Shakespearean element to it as well? There is, but I'm yeah. I'm not going to say anything about that yet. But there, yes, there is. <laughs> there All definitely right. is. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with us today. And mom, do you have some final words? I do. This is this is directed at at this delightful author. If possible in life, do what you love and love what you do. Well, I Aww. think I think Rajani's got that one down. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us, and see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Bye now. Bye. Thank you.